And um, so, so I managed to get that. So that's basically what the first book was about. It was trying to get people to realize that when they're running their projects, a lot of the training we have in things like the body of knowledge and so on is great stuff, but it's not the human stuff. Now, since that book, the book came out, people have realized that human beings are important. We even talk about the neuro, neuroscience of projects and stuff. But often these topics are bolted onto the projects. They're not integral into the project. Um, so that's one element. So I did, I rewritten it to try and explain how these things fit a bit better. Because people have heard about things, but they won't know where they use them in the project. What does it mean when I have a meeting, etc.? So I've tried to build that in. It's... Hi and welcome to the Sunday Lunch Project Manager Podcast for Sunday the 26th of May 2024. This is your host Nigel Creaser and today we've got Eddie O'Beng returning to the show, the old change guy. Hi it's Nigel again. Um, if you are listening to this that means that you are listening to the old style of the podcast. Um, you may like the old style of having it split into two pieces, but I know some of my listeners didn't. So what I've done, I have created the option for you to be able to listen to everything all in one go. You don't have to wait till next week. You could get it now. Uh, at the moment, it's just on Spotify. We'll be coming on Patreon as well. Um, costs you was it three quid plus that, I think it is, um, over a month. And that means you get the whole thing all in one go. So, uh, the other advantage, that'll be coming out on a Sunday. This one, you will notice, has just come out on Monday. Wouldn't make a big difference, really, but there you go. You've got it. Um, you've got that choice. Helps me uh, in, invest in um, uh, better equipment and uh, maybe uh, a few other bonus items going forward. So, if you can spare, since you get a cup of coffee uh, once a month, uh, and you get the benefit of getting it earlier and getting it all together. So, um, pop along to Spotify. Uh, have a look in there where it is, and there's there'll be a, a little lock sign against um, one called number 132 slash 133, uh, John Henny, the voice coach. And that's the combined one, and you should be able to click on there, do what Spotify tells you to do, to register and put all your payments in. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's it. And uh, the, the only thing, if you have done that, and you do do it, I don't know if I get details on it yet. It's very new. So send me... Um, a ping me a message through whatever medium uh, you can get hold of me and you'll get a mention on the show so again thanks very much and uh, okay, let you carry on with the show cheers now so I have a number of sponsors affiliate links um in the way that it's set up um, that have kindly allowed me to uh, um, share their services really. The first one um, is Mike Lane and Mike runs PM online PM courses and it is a great resource for um, getting those fundamentals of project management uh, trained, reasonably priced uh, and Mike um, presents it in an accessible and um, uh, clear manner. Um, you can check out some of his um, uh, videos on, on his YouTube channel and kind of give you a view of where they are. But um, the, the code for that, if you go to nigelcreaser.com slash online PM courses, all, all one word, low case, that'll redirect you to it. Um, there's very different levels that you can um, buy. You can buy individual courses, you can buy pathways as well if you like um, and I get a kickback off those uh, Mike kindly uh, shares me that so um, if you do jump on and use it I hope you find it really useful um, I think he has money back guarantees and things like that as well so there's a very limited risk um, on that so uh, jump on that and that again it's nigelcreaser.com slash online pm courses and enjoy 
So today I am delighted to welcome back Professor Eddie Obeng to the show. Now, Eddie uh, is a force of nature. He's been described uh, by the Financial Times as a leading revolutionary and an agent provocateur. He is a professor of the School of Enterprise Enter- Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Henley Business School and co-founder of and learning director at Pentacle, the virtual business school. And he is a leading business theorist, innovator and educator. He's an author of over 10 books um, and uh, writes on a wide range of topics um, from adapting to change, leadership, innovation and organisation. Um, and uh, his writing and teaching concepts have been incorporated into 40% of the FTSE 100 or FT 100, should I say. He's a pioneer of digital transformation, design thinking, organisational agility, and he provides a no-nonsense overview on how traditional rules of business doing business no longer apply while they're offering guidance on how to do it better, really. So, Eddie, welcome back to the show. Um, for those who've not who don't know you and those who did, haven't heard you on the show before, do you want to tell us a little bit more background about you and uh, uh, how you got to where you're doing doing now? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So, um, Nigel's done a great job of, of sort of doing a little thumbnail sketch. Um, I I basically do three or four things. I work out what what's not working, especially in things like project area, but in other topics. I then figure out what to do to make them work. I write about it and I speak about it and I teach about it. And then I've organized so that I can help people put it into practice by using uh, digital technology, virtual reality, so they can actually make it happen. So that's that's basically me. I'm a very simple person. Brilliant. So we we spoke on LinkedIn uh, Actually, it was only a couple of days ago, wasn't it? Really, we just uh, had, had a chat, probably last week, and and we kind of turned around this interview quite quickly this time. Um, I, I seem to recall last time when we had you on the show, we had a lot of twos, twos and fro's, and uh, but we did manage to get it quite quickly, so we're getting more efficient as time goes on. I'm sure. And yes. uh, you, you mentioned that you are, are going through with um, uh, an update to one of well, your best-selling book, All Change. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and you've got a new edition coming out. Um, yeah. And as it's described here, is how to do successful change for people who aren't professional project or program managers, which uh, is most of the people out there. And I think <laughs> uh, we, are, we are aimed at project management yeah. uh, from a podcast point of view. There are people I know who aren't project managers but are interested in that, who listen to the show. And I, I think it is a an interesting one. In fact, I was interviewed um, a, a lady called Anara Azbeklova. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've probably said her name wrong again. Um, who a really book called a Little PM book, oh, okay. which um, we were chatting the other day, and, and I always struck me that project management is a life skill. Since yeah. I've been doing project management, we, we and it's a little bit like geometry. No one realizes they're using geometry um, until someone tries to teach them geometry, and mm-hmm. I think project management a little bit like that no one realizes some of the life skills we use to break down pieces of work to make change happen in our own lives are using similar skills to project management but then applying that in the professional domain or in the business domain or in in societal domain makes it much bigger and and in some ways it becomes harder to do something quite simple yes and that's a long sort of thing to pitch there to you really is that why did you write all changes why did you write it for people who who aren't project managers and and why do you need to do an update now surely you wrote the right thing did you do it wrong the first time yeah (laughs) maybe yes no actually it's it's quite funny because it's for both people who who are experts in project management but want to be better and for people who are not project managers it's both ends of the spectrum the people i sort of ignored are the ones in the middle if that's if yeah. that's not too mean, um, yeah, that's one way of putting it. I, maybe I did get it wrong, but really, the book is for both ends of the spectrum. It's for people who actually don't see projects as a thing and don't have the skills and the professionalism, but also the professionals who want to be much better. It's just not aimed at the group in the middle. Um, it's aimed at the people who are good pro- project managers, professional project managers, got all the basic skills, and then they want that little bit extra. So that's what I've tried to to uh, do with the book. And when I explain the structure, that'll make a lot more sense. Uh, I, 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 the first book, which I have here, <laughs> the, 
which I wrote about 30 years ago. I have to explain how that one came about. So a lot of people who, who are listening to you are probably project managers, and they won't know that their careers turn on something which they probably never heard of, which is the Sunday when Margaret Thatcher was ejected from office. So what happened was, I was I was at Ashridge and I was just doing my normal work and stuff, and I got a chance to write an article for the Sunday Times. And I wrote an article which said something like, um, uh, project managers can show you the way, you know, whoever you are, you need a project management, blah, blah, blah. you can use it in your business, blah, blah, blah et cetera, et cetera. Uh, CEOs are not using projects because they don't know what it is. So it was just a piece which in those days, 30 odd years ago, was unusual. And it was on the back of the Sunday Times. But that was the weekend when Margaret Thatcher got ejected. And in the olden days, before we had social media, people wouldn't listen to news all week. Then on Sundays, they'd read all the news. And because the prime minister was being booted out, everyone on the planet, not just in the UK, read that book. And suddenly, project management became a thing. And if you're sort of my age, you'll, you'll sort of know there's a, like a hockey stick. And people like Martin Barnes and Mike Smith and people that we always used to joke about the hockey stick where suddenly project management. Oh, oh, oh. because before that, if you had an executive and you were naughty, then they would put you into special projects. And that was like the end of your career. <laughs> yeah. So um, so that happened. Project management took off. The course I was running at Ashridge became very popular. I realized that I needed to start to structure it so people could see what to do. And uh, at the time, I'd already been sort of publishing stuff on non-traditional projects. Um, so 30, 40 years ago, most projects, people would say a waterfall. Um, I call them paint by numbers, like the little books where you have the numbers in. You do the blues and the reds and it's a dolphin, you know, follow process. And the process is quite strict. People would say a project is something with a beginning, a middle and an end. And I went and talked to people and I realized that not all the projects, even before we'd rolled it out outside construction and, and so on and IT and so on, were beginning, a middle and end. And I'd spotted that some projects actually were quite unclear, like organizational structural changes and things like that. And they didn't seem to have this format. And I'd come up with this really very simple sort of two by two grid where I, I didn't, I'll interview people and I say, how easy is it to define the goals? And they say, yes, it is. No, it isn't. And how easy is it to know what you're supposed to be doing? So they go, yes, it is. No, it isn't. So it's a what on one axis and a how on the other. And what I realized was there were two polar ends. One end was the paint by numbers, the waterfall, where you knew what you're doing, how you're going to do it, beginning, middle, and end. Other end was um, the first project I tripped over, well, that one was something called SWIFT. It was interbank uh, uh, system for moving money around the world. They had this idea. They didn't really understand it. They didn't have any of the mechanisms. And it was quite unclear what to do step to step to step. I nicknamed those foggy projects. And then I had like names for the other two, but we'll park that for now. And I went to a conference in Trondheim and I presented this model of mine saying not all projects are the same. And I finished my presentation <laughs> and somebody stood up at the back and they said, Dr. Bang has is 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 deluded. <laughs> he's he's got no idea at all about projects. He's a complete idiot. Projects must be clear, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And so I was standing at the front, completely sort of shell-shocked and slightly embarrassed, because I just delivered this thing in this auditorium with like 500, 600 people in front of me. And the first comment I got back as a question was an insult. And then someone else in the audience said, No, 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 you're wrong. Dr. Bang is correct. Some projects are hard to define. And then there was this bun fight of insults amongst the audience where they were hurling insults backwards and forwards. And I just sat back on the table with my legs crossed for about five minutes watching this. And then finally the chairman stopped it. So I knew I was on to something. I knew people were interested in projects. I knew we had to find new ways of communicating projects. And so that's why I wrote the first book. Yeah, so I, it's interesting, isn't it? It's because, as you say, it was 30 years ago when you wrote that. And uh, when we look now at the the VUCA, sort of over the last five or six years, VUCA has been a, uh, a a term that I'd never heard of until actually it was the PMI 50-year uh, anniversary synergy event in 2019 where the term VUCA was the first time I'd heard of it. Um, and and actually that that, timing was quite good there because the the level of volatility and that we mm -hmm. got through covid era and that and then 
actually the level of ambiguity that we've got now with the um, speed of AI and the, that change is just so dramatic now. And I saw something right. the other day, which was, I can't remember what it was, but the ex- exact stats, but it was something like um, someone who'd lived, say, from 1800 up to like 1970, 1890s to 1970. Yeah. The amount of change that they saw in those like 80 years. Yes. But at the current pace, we're seeing that as a society in something like two years. Yeah. In the amount of change. And that's why it's not a surprise that uh, there's that overload from a lot of us and the fact that we're having to deal in, in everyday life with that change. Yeah. You know, the yes. old change thing where you're going through disbelief, anger, all those sort of things. We, we seem to be going through that. Every couple of your latest social media pro, um, uh, tool that you like using goes bankrupt, gets bought by some lunatic, Correct. and you don't like it anymore. And or it just stops being used and gets turned off, or get something. I got very animated about some of the tooling I use for doing the podcast the other day because someone it's perfect for me, it works lovely, I like it, and they're going to change it completely. And I'm like, yeah, oh. yeah. And, and that. That ambiguity, that that fogginess of projects has got more uh, over my experience. It was when I've started coming up 20 years, 25, 30 years ago, project management, I was it was all about that paint by numbers approach. Yes. Correct. Yeah, you, you knew what you were doing. And and I still think some people think there is always that quite often there's a let's summarize it at paint by numbers level, but underneath it it's there's this fog sea of fog. Yes, there but is. No one is what it is, but they're telling someone at that exact level. Yeah, Correct. it's this. I, 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 see. I mean, we'll explore how to deal with that because often there isn't enough language being used to deal with what people want. Because if it's paint by numbers, then then you need to be structured and organized and f- have your plans. If it's fog, you take one step at a time and have trust and hold on to people's hands. They're not the same. So the methods you use for the two different types of change are completely different. And if you haven't understood that, you get it wrong and then you fail. But going back to the yeah. VUCA thing, VUCA is really, it's really, it's really intrigues me because it's a rebranding of. So the first idea about the fact the world might be changing a lot was put out there, in my view, by a chap called Ellie Goldratt, um, probably late eighties ish, nineteen eighties ish, and he was looking at the manufacturing industry, which had just imploded in America, and he realized that there was something broken because. A manufacturing company would be doing not very well. Then they'd, they'd go in, try to rescue it, reduce the number of products, focus on the profitable products. Things would get more complex. And then uh, what would effectively happen is they would go bust. And he couldn't he couldn't articulate it properly. And he described it as um, uh, the throughput world versus the, I forgot what the other, cost world. The cost world mindset was it's structured. Let's just deal with the bits and everything. And his argument was everything's changing. Everything's moving. And Ellie Goldratt was sort of my mentor when I was at Ashridge. I learned a lot from him. I went on his programs and stuff. And out of that, I I, I, I produced and published uh, something called the New World uh, Management Approach. So I've got a TED Talk. So if anyone's interested, it's in 12 minutes. Go and watch that because it'll explain. But what I explained was that we had to recognize that there the, the, were a number of things going on. For example, if you looked at the pace of change, over a 20-year period, it would quite happily be uh, accelerating upwards. Which way should I do it? Is that the right way? Okay. So it's, this is the past and that's the future. Is that the right way for you? Yeah. Should I do it that way? I'll do it. Well, I don't know. The thing is, they rotate, these, these things rotate people a different way to what they are anyway. So you never know. Okay. Right? Let, me do, the... let me do it across my chest. Okay. So the pace of change is going like that, increasing. Number of people on the planet, same curve. Uh, use of technology, Moore's law, same curve. Volatility yeah. in markets, especially commodity markets, same curve. So I, I published with a number of my colleagues at Ashridge that, look, this is what's happening to the change, the volatility and so on. But when we look at our client organizations, and we ask them how they're responding. What we've discovered is they're still using annual budgeting cycles. They're still using three monthly quarterly cycles. The decision make, uh, meetings are every month. And you can't do stuff which your boss won't let you do. So for them, the pace of cha- learning is quite flat. So the world's changing like this. And the pace of change uh, learning is quite flat. So I, pos- I hypothesized that a time would come 
where the pace of change was up here and our ability to learn was down here. And at that point, you'd suddenly find your life as a mess because having been used to being able to learn fast and the world was changing, you could see what was coming. You could define your projects. You knew that your software would be there for 20 years. You could get spare parts for your car, etc. All of a sudden, somebody would be talking about a topic and you would never have even heard that word before. Uh, won't be able to make, we won't be able to make sense of it. But the structures we built for what I call the old world would also fail us because the old world is built on the assumption that the boss knows more than the subordinates, knows more than the next lot, and that knowledge flows like that. But when you hit your new world, which is changing, chances the boss knows about what AI is is zero. So the decision making is broken, the information flow is broken, and as it accelerates, you hit another problem. You and I are talking, and uh, I'm probably talking, I talk quite fast, so I don't know, 100, 100 words per minute, 120, 200 words per minute. Okay. Um, so if you're in a meeting, that's how fast information can flow from one person to another. But of course, if you're on the internet or if you're on a, 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 on a network, a digital network, hundreds of thousands of megabits per second. So the information flowing ar around outside the organization is far faster than you can get it into the organization, in up the structures, into the people who make the decisions for them to learn and make the right decisions and pass them all down. So most organizations are actually, we can call it autopilot, but actually they're not functioning. And the way we saw that was suddenly the executives stopped trying to run their own businesses and started buying and acquiring others and merging them because they didn't know what to do internally. Um, so all of that's part of the same thing. The stat about the amount of data is always a bit suspect because in the past, if you ask somebody, what's that plant? They go, it's Hedgefoot. They say, what's that bird? That's a tweety tweet bird. Um, etc. What's the weather going to be like tomorrow? They'd look up, they'd look at the stars, they'd work it out and they go, it's going to be sunny. So they knew different things. They absorbed different data. We are now quite disconnected from nature. Nature is quite complex. It's data rich. If you don't believe me, go for a walk in the forest and count the leaves. Okay. Yeah. And so we keep trying to compare our lives, which are actually quite data poor and disconnected from nature, from the people in the past. The thing which makes our lives bad is we have a smaller set of things, but they're, they're out of control and they impact all the elements of our lives. Sorry, I've gone off piste from talking about projects. <laughs> you did ask. <laughs> but it's interesting, though, is that, like I said, projects is a life skill. Yes, it and is. Life is life drives projects and projects drive life. Yes, exactly. It, it literally, do you know what I mean? It's kind of... I've got, um, we talked earlier, I'm making guitars, yeah? Yeah. I'm essentially doing the same thing as I'm delivering a project when I'm doing one of those things. I'm breaking yeah. it down into component parts. I've got some instructions on how to do it. Some bits of it I don't know how to do yeah. and I, because it's um, the style and the um, the look of it and what I yeah. feel like. Yeah. And, and the bits I'm using are generally what I'm trying to do are pieces of, uh, discarded stuff in my shed in my garage. Mm. So again, it's a voyage of discovery whether one bolt works as a bridge or or doesn't. And is it too yeah. high? Is it too low? And that fogginess is there yes, just in that exactly. little. And 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 even now, uh, I've got version two and three of those right. coming out. Uh, as I know, I've got to do. I've got to. I had to buy a new hammer because I need to hammer something right. specifically. Exactly. Um, and and that's. New edition of, of, of each of those will happen. Exactly. And, and so as the world and, accelerates, sorry, go on, finish. No, you, you carry on, yeah. As the world accelerates, there's more change. And it's always important to remember that change is not the same as improvement. Improvement is a subset of change. So when change happens, some of it's improvement, some of it is challenges, i.e. your work life's getting better, and some of it's opportunity. And so you go, what change should I do to match that opportunity, challenge, or improvement. So that's what the project is. The project is the chunk of change you do to match what you see in your mind. That's what, that's what basically what a project is. And those chunks, some of them are like paint by numbers. I built this guitar before I did it out of the same bits to fog. Oh my goodness, I'm trying to make a guitar out of a bit of soap. <laughs> how do I do that? Where yeah. do I start, etc. Don't know what, don't know how. Um, yeah. So there's that. I'd left out the other two. Uh, those are projects where you know what, but you haven't got a clue how you're going to do it. 
Um, and then the ones where you've bought the technology, you know, bought the thing, you've got, you've got the how, but you're not sure what will come out. That's AI. AI is classic, what I would call a movie project. You know, a movie, you have the camera, you don't have the script, you film something, it's always rubbish, you need the script. Uh, the other type, I call them quests, because it's like King Arthur and the quest for the Holy Grail. Let's get the Holy Grail. Where is it? I don't know. Let's go looking everywhere. So those are the yeah. other two. But AI, for example, is touted as it's going to change our lives. It probably will. It might not. But at the moment, it's a movie. It's a solution looking for a problem with millions yeah. and billions behind it. So it's desperately looking for a problem. And it will solve a problem whether there was a problem there or not. <laughs> the internet did that a little bit, didn't it? Say, say. The internet did that a little bit. <laughs> when yeah. it, was, it, was, it was used as a communication device, right. it was quite useful. Quite tall. It was kind of, and and what well, the computer did as well. Yeah. It's kind of the people who were looking at it at the time that like, that was only a few people who are going to need it. And that Correct. Famous quote from yeah, the guy exactly. from IBM. <laughs> I can't. I mean, you might need one in every office or whatever. Um, but that that vision changes, that use changes, and yes. and like you said, plus AI at the moment, the, the internet's done it. Right. Correct. Fine. Who would have thought sitting watching? people's cats rolling around on the floor would be something of interest and amusement to people. Um, AI is the same thing. In who, who in 2019, I, I did my book, okay, um, which was about how to, how to uh, just my little potted things of things I've done to help my day go quicker and easier and using a few bit of automation, a little bit of decision-making stuff and things like that. And that was 2019. I can't remember when I released it now, but anyway, whenever I was 2021, so whatever, it was before that, I think it was within six months, certainly 12 months, mm. suddenly that GPT-3 is there. Suddenly, yeah. um, that AI, as you say, it was from that day forward, it was hockey stick. And it wasn't even a, um, I didn't even use the word artificial intelligence when describing some mm -hmm. of the automation I did, which it is, it's just the level of artificial intelligence, but that automation using Outlook automation and a few other things. And I've done some other things with automating stuff on a phone. And, but the scale that that changed yeah. is massive on one, its capability, but then use cases that are coming out that I'm seeing there that I just sit there and I never even thought of that as yeah. a use case. Exactly. And I saw something the other day. I used one where I loaded up the, my project management song into it and it started it generated a video for me yeah. and it needed tweak but actually for the base content it, it listened to the words it kind of put the Good timing enough. and it it grabbed the video of this going on of this going on it and stitched it together and i'm like yeah as a base base thing you could go right as a i'm trying to think of an idea you do that you create a little movie in this instance you go to a professional and say you want something like that sure. go and make it for me and sure. you've you've done mock-ups and it i see i see a lot of people using it for mocking up same as yeah. 3d printing using yeah. that sort of thing yeah. taking off the same as so, ai but... but what is what so rolling back a little bit so the thing about ai which people don't realize is it's really really old when i was doing engineering we were programming neural networks okay yeah. uh neural network so artificial intelligence the name make fools people because they think artificial means it's not quite intelligent but it's an artifice because a neuron is sort of shaped like my hand. You know, there's the little bits which are getting them incoming messages, the nucleus over here, and then it fires the message down and then your feet, your toes move, or whatever it is, okay? So a neural network's very much the same. Put data in here, do some sums, decide where's the right answer. If it's the right answer, good. If it's not, come back, do it again. And it basically builds a four by four matrix. So when you put data mm -hmm. in here, it says, okay, I, hand, hand, draw this. Music, do that picture, whatever it is. So that's what it's doing. There's no algorithm in there. The reason it's become popular, of course, is because the gamers were using uh, chips which are not general CPUs. They're using specialized graphics chips which do the calculations really fast. And so that's why it's become a thing because the, soft, the hardware became cheap. Um, so people will play with it. But the reality is it's not intelligence. It be used, because it does things like use words, we anthropomorphize it. So we think it's smarter than it is. I always say to people, if you're going to take any AI seriously, ask you about something you don't know anything about, be suitably impressed. Then ask you about something where you're the world expert and see what, what that yeah. looks like. 
and you'll discover it doesn't know anything. It's an averaging, it's an interpolation machine. It's not going to create anything new. It's just inside that thing. You will, you will have to do all the, the creative work. So um, unfortunately, if you're not a creative person, you'll think that doing the mock-ups is helping you, but you'll just choose the wrong mock-up because you're not a creative person. So there's a lot of... <laughs> I'm being too negative, but but there's a lot of stuff to be done. And in terms of delivering projects, um, it's really crucial because people want to use it in project management. They're very excited about it, but they're missing the actual fundamentals of delivering projects. So what I wrote in the first book was two parts. When I started realizing there were different types of projects, the other thing I realized was that when you're running a project, all the non-human bits stay the same overnight and all the human be being bits can do anything. People can change their minds. They can have a second conversation. So I realized that soft stuff was going to be very important. And then I did uh, something called a bubble diagram. And I realized that to make a project work, there were like five things you had to get your head around. One was this type of project thing. Is it for or, or paint by numbers? The second was people related. Who are these people? What do they want? How am I going to influence them? What am I going to do with them? The third was people related. I'm leading this bunch of people. Why wouldn't they do what I ask them to do? My team is rubbish, et cetera, et cetera. Then the fourth was... Um, about people again, but it's about learning and review. Are they telling me the truth? Are we finding out what's going on? And it was only the fifth one, which was mechanical, which is planning, coordination, risk management, and so on. So most of the elements were either the situation you found yourself in or people-ish. Okay. Mm. And so that's what I wrote the book about. And the way I tried to get that across was I wrote the first half of the book as a as a story and the hardback copy sort of looked like this because they didn't have that idea. More importantly, because my persuasion skills were rubbish. So the the softback version, which came out immediately, I was able to bully them because the hardback version went to number one. So then I became important. So I could say, well, I want it this way. So this side is all change. It's a story. And when you start from that side, the front cover says all change and it tells you a story. Then you flip the book over and it says the project leader's secret handbook. And this bit is that me explaining those five different areas and what you do about them. How do you do it? And um, so, so I managed to get that. So that's basically what the first book was about. It was trying to get people to realize that when they're running their projects, a lot of the training we have in things like the body of knowledge and so on is great stuff, but it's not the human -y stuff. Now, since that book, the book came out, people have realized that human beings are important. We even talk about the neuro, neuroscience of projects and stuff. But often these topics are bolted onto the projects. They're not integral into the project. Um, so that's one element. So I did, I rewritten it to try and explain how these things fit a bit better because people have heard about things, but they won't know where they use them in the project. What does it mean when I have a meeting, etc.? So I've tried to build that in. The other thing I've done is I've added, sorry? Yeah, I've seen that. I've seen that. I'm just saying, thinking there, you get you recognize it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I recognize it. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's really important because they can spout all the words, you know, oh, hey, that one's raising my portal, whatever it is, okay? And then they don't know what to do on a day to day basis. Um, yeah. And, or they'll know the theory. I've got to be empathetic. And then they don't know yeah. how to do it, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, so, yeah, so I'm, I'll, do, I'll do an empathy course and get a certificate. I'll tell everyone that I've got the stiff gut, therefore I am empathetic. <laughs> yeah. And the performance of projects, you have to put in context. When I was a young man, a quarter of projects failed. Thank goodness they failed. We're rid of them. Half of projects were van projects, which suck the living blood out of you, or poltergeist projects, which hang around smelling bad, spooking everyone, never going away, never getting delivered. And a quarter of them were supposed to be successful, and those people lied. Okay. It hasn't changed very much in 30 years, despite us professionalizing everything. And that's because we are not integrating the learning and the behaviors and the emotions and the thinking into the project leader to make the, the person perform. Another great sponsor of the show it comes in the form of Air Manual. Um, Air Manual is a well, it's a tool for documenting process, which um, and best practices. Um, uh, it's run. Well, it's, it's a company formed by a guy, one of my uh, interviewees, uh, Alexis Kingsbury. Um, essentially, uh, and, I, and I kind of summarised why my view of where we see documentation a lot. My experience has been people will document something, a process. They'll put it in a, a visio diagram that gets loaded onto a SharePoint site or something similar. 
and then a bunch of pro- that. So then, once that that diagram has been shared with senior management, they're happy. They have a process in the business. But then the the detailed procedures underneath it might be in with documents in uh, just poorly kept and not linked easily and not updated. And what Air Manual does, it allows you to put in a it's a tool for doing this kind of thing. You whack it in. Uh, the service in there, get in there, put in your process, your flow, and you build it down to as low a level of detail, even to the point of checklists where people can check off they've done it. So it creates that um, uh, guided checklists, um, easy to create, easy to maintain, and all in one place. And no one's kind of rooting around to find the SharePoint, and then when you change to new SharePoint services and all that stuff, it's all there. So if you pop along to nigelpreaser.com slash airmanual, um, there's a bit more detail there and a link there to click on to um, go and get. I think uh, they offer a trial and things like that. So uh, uh, it, uh, it, it's something that I think uh, can easily um, reduce the amount of errors, rework, etc. within our organisation. So um, yeah, take it. you're thinking ooh I wonder what the next bit's going to be yeah it's frustrating isn't it um you heard at the beginning of the show where I said uh, there's a way around that so if you're really itching and you want to hear the next bit of uh, this show uh, jump down to Patreon have a look find the one that's got a little lock on it click on it and you'll be able to get the second half uh, along with the first half all together and you, you won't get this annoying bit or the annoying bit at the beginning that I just uh, done as well. Um, so, yeah, give it a go. Just doing your price of a coffee. Cheers. Well, I hope you enjoyed the first part of that interview with Eddie. I know uh, I did. And come back next week and have a listen. Look after yourself. Cheers now. Bye. So this is my final wrap up. Every week you're going to hear this. You're going to get bored of it, but you can always click next podcast if so. Um, If you have enjoyed it, if you've listened to this podcast to the end of this uh, show and you think that was great, I'd love to be able to help Nigel out. Um, There are loads of ways you can do it. Um, The the first and and obvious way is to um, share the podcast. Send it out to people. Um, if you if you know colleagues and friends who'd benefit from it, you think they'd enjoy it, just send them the link. Grab one of the links send, or send them to www.nigelcreaser.com slash podcasts. That's ni- www.nigelcreaser.com slash podcasts. And that will push them over to a, um, a link tree link and it's got all of the different ways they can consume the, the podcast. Uh, if you are feeling generous and have a big bag of cash, you could grab a copy of one of my books. Obviously, um, uh, they're available in all the usual places, and print and, and, and digital. Again, jump on the website, uh, www.nigelcreaser.com slash shop, and that will give you a list of all the different ways that you can contribute um, and, and grab copies of the book. Also got... Um, links to all my guests books on there as well where I get a little bit of a kickback from them um, if you are of a sporting mind um, I have a number through doing some of my uh, judo and, and running uh, antics uh, I've managed to secure a few um, uh, affiliate links and affiliates uh, there as well so in there somewhere in the sponsors page there's links to those as well so clicking onto those and grabbing uh, your if you're and with it, if you're looking to uh, get super fit, then that would be fabulous as well. And I get a little kickback from those. Uh, I have a Patreon account. It's patreoncom slash Sunday Lunch PM. Uh, so again, you can ping something in there, buy me a coffee or whatever. And finally, obviously, the most important is coming back, coming back, listen again, um, because uh, the more of you that come back. Uh, the more uh, visibility I get because there's more times that it's downloaded and all the SEO works and things like that. So 
yeah, that's it. So, uh, if you can help me out, I would be much appreciated. If you can't, don't worry about it. Thank you very much. Cheers now. Bye. Uh, my latest, uh, the, the, the latest uh, affiliate that I've got on the show now is Riverside. Um, I use Riverside to do my interviews, Riverside FM. Um, <clears throat> it kind of offers you a whole, if you like, micro studio management producer tool and, and, and goes beyond that. has a really good free layer <clears throat> and I... Um, I've been using it for a while now. I find it really good. When I've had issues, even though I'm not on one of the higher paid levels, the support has been quick, responsive, and, and, and of high quality, and, and people keen to help me. Uh, the organisation seems really good. The product seems really intuitive, um, and uh, quality is really good as well. And they, it's, a, it's a clever way of doing it is when you're, you're recording through your browsers, so you're not got loads of desktop resources being used compared to some other products that I've used um, and what they also do is they do a, um, they stream a, a lower quality version of it up onto uh, as you're doing the interview so you're not burning bandwidth while you're doing the interview and potentially uh, impacting on the quality of the conversation uh, and then at the end it uploads it uh, the, the higher quality from your browser um, I mean it, it's just a really good way of doing it so um, if you are uh, thinking of doing a podcast and you're supposed to do a podcast, I, I would recommend using this tool. I find it really good. Best, best of the tools that I've tried using um, today. And you can get that at nigelcreaser.com slash riverside. And that will redirect you to uh, my kickback page uh, on their site. And there I will get a little kickback uh, from them. So um, take a look. Thanks. Well, it's goodbye from me, Nigel Creaser, and it's goodbye from him, the Sunday Lunch PM. Goodbye.